Uh, but if you flip over to the book of Acts, and I think it's in the seventh chapter, you're going to find out as it says, uh, this is a, uh, as you read it here in Exodus, it reads as though it's a very short period of time. But it says that it came to pass in those days, or it could say it came to pass in those years, because this was 40 years later uh, since Moses, uh, his, uh, his mother sent him uh, floating down the, uh, the river. He's picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, all these different things. There's a lot of things that's happened in his time frame. But understand it came to pass when Moses was grown that he went out into his brethren. Now, Moses was a Hebrew. He was a child of the, he, 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 was, he was a part of those that was in bondage, but he was a privileged uh, one that was in bondage. I need you to stay with me. Let's understand that there's a few things we really got to grasp right here so we can really get into it. Uh, if you flip over into the book of Acts and in the seventh chapter, I want you to find this. It says in the Acts 7.23, and when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren. Understand here, we're going to find out that it came into his heart, something laid upon his Heart, something told him there was something inside him that said go and see your brethren and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now understand that it came upon his heart. He walks out here and he goes out and he sees an Egyptian man. He sees uh, uh, this person. He says uh, smiting. And understand that he was hitting him. He was beating him. He would have been the taskmaster. He would have been the one who was in charge of uh, what it is that they had to do. So he went uh, and he said and he spied this Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And it says in verse 12, he looked this way and he looked that way. I have read this point. Po portion of scripture a million times I have never caught this I was listening to a preacher preach this week and he said those words really really slow and it just it really sank into me and, and God really began to speak to me at this point it says and he looked this way and that way what was he doing Moses saw something that didn't sit quite well with him, and he looked this way, and he looked that way. It says, and he saw no man. So pause with me here for a moment, because we're going to look at this in so many different perspectives. It ain't going to be funny. I'm going to confuse you if you ain't careful, if you ain't uh, uh, following along with us. It says, Moses went out, it came into his heart to go visit his brethren. He saw somebody being mean to him. He looked this way, and he looked that way. First way we're going to look at this is Moses was the only one that was there. He looked this way, and he looked that way. He saw no man. He wanted someone else to intervene. Stay with me. Moses went out into his brethren. He saw somebody being mistreated. He looked this way. He looked that way. The Bible says he saw no man. Do you think Moses desired to see someone else? Do you think Moses desired to see someone else sweeping in to save the day so he didn't have to get his hands dirty, so he didn't have to put forth the effort, so he didn't have to do anything? That is exactly what probably what Moses had desired. He looked this way and that way. And he saw no man. How many times is it that we as Christian people can see our brothers and our sisters uh, in need, if you will, and what do we do? We're going to look this way and that way and figure out who it is that is supposed to help them. We look over here and we'll say, well, hey, you know, this is, should be the pastor and the deacon's job. They should be the one doing this. Well, you know, they, they're, they're in their classroom. It should be the Sunday school teacher's job to do that. It is an issue of this. It's their job. We want to figure out whose job it is when reality it's ours. A born-again believer, it is your job. Stay with me. He looked this way and that way. You're going to hear me say that several times this morning. He looked around. His head was on a swivel. Probably looked like he was crossing the road there for a minute because he stood and he was looking this way and over here and here. And here, I wonder how long he stood and looked and probably thought. And uh, he, he was probably uh, uh, trying to figure out what should happen here. Now, Moses had a choice that he could make in this very moment as he stood and he looked this way and he looked that way. Understand, he didn't know what to do. He was hoping someone else would be there. He was looking over here and he was looking over there now. He saw no man, so what did he realize? Ain't nobody looking. Ain't nobody going to see. I can act very irrationally right now and nobody's going to know. Because he looked this way and that way. And he didn't see nobody. 
So he thought, you know what? This old boy's got it coming. He's being mean to my brethren. He's taking out, uh, he, he's just picking on these boys for whatever reason. Understand he'd been here for 40 years and he never cared to go out and see his brethren. 40 years he'd been in training with the Egyptians. 40 years he had had a privileged life and for some reason on this day it came into his heart to go out and see his brethren. 40 years that taskmaster probably beat the Hebrew kids quite frequently. The slaves. So here comes Moses, he comes out and he looks this way and he looks that way and he sees no man, he wants somebody to do something. He sees nobody around and he thinks, ain't nobody going to see what I'm about to do. So he decides he's going to take matters into his own hands. Something came into Moses' heart and he thought, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to see my brethren. Something spoke into his heart and said, I, he just decided again after 40 years that he was going to see his brethren. And the first thing he sees is someone being mean to them. And now he has to act. And nobody's looking. You ever been put in a spot where God, maybe you, you, you're pretty sure that God had called you somewhere, God had put you in a situation, but you have no earthly idea how to act upon it. You have no earthly idea what to do. You look left, you look right, you look all around and you see nobody that's going to intervene and do things for you. You have to act. It's all on you. You ain't got a clue in the world what to do. This is exactly where Moses was. He was set in a position that he wanted to intervene. He didn't know what to do. But the only thing he knew from the Egyptians was violence. I'll take care of matters. Ain't no problem. I'm going to kill this guy. He does. You read it in the Bible. He slew the Egyptian. And immediately understand he knew he had done wrong because what did he do? Read it. And hid him in the sand. Moses lived a privileged life. Did he not? He was adopted, if you will, by Pharaoh's daughter. But he was still a Hebrew. And it probably ain't going to look good no Hebrew killing no Egyptian, Right? It dongs on Moses. He's thinking, oh man, what have I done? Well, it's a good thing I looked this way and that way and I didn't see nobody, so I can just drag this boy over here and I can bury him now. Ain't nobody going to be none the wiser. Right? But he was coming to the defense of two people, right? So somebody saw. He looked this way and that way and he saw no man. How often do we, Christian people, do we church people, and stay with me, how often is it that we look this way and we look that way and we don't see nobody we associate with at the church house? We don't see nobody that knows that we are supposed to be a Christian. We don't see anybody around that really is going to call us out on our actions and we just decide to act irrationally just as Moses did. How often do we look this way and that way and, well, there ain't nobody around, there ain't nobody going to hear Ain't nobody going to say anything to me. Something's got to be done. I have to act. And you know what? This is the only thing I know to do. Moses had the very best of intentions right here. He wanted to help. He just didn't know how. He didn't know what to do. He'd done the only thing that he knew that would stop that man from hurting his brethren. He killed him. And then... He hid it. You know that by him hiding it, there was remorse. Was there not? You read on down, and it said when the Pharaoh heard of these things, he, he set out to, to, to kill Moses. That's what the Bible's going to say. Moses had every right in the world to hide what it was that he had done. But somebody still saw it. He thought he got off scot free. Somebody's seen it. Because the word got out. Amen. If you ever read your Bible, the word got out. 
He thought he looked this way and he looked that way and he got off scot-free. There was nobody seen him. Well, somebody did. Understand that. Stay with me. You think Moses might could have thought his way through that? Did he really take time to think at all? You read it and understand that we're not given the full uh, uh, totality of all the circumstances that was here. But understand that Moses came out. He looked upon his brethren. He seen one of them being uh, beaten by the Egyptians. He looked this way and he looked that way. He saw no man and he slew the Egyptian. Does it really give time for Moses to have thought that through? But he had time to think about it afterwards well, as he was dragging the Egyptian man around, uh, probably around some corner of some building or of some shed somewhere and burying, covering him up in the sand. He hid him there. He had time to think. All that evening, he had time to think. And when he went out the second day, why you think after 40 years of living here, that he just decided on these two days that he was going to go out. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. Now, I understand there's two men fighting here. There's two of the same people fighting. Now, this is entirely different for Moses because it's not, it's not an oppressor who's coming up and, and who is beating down his brethren. Understand that. Moses is wanting to intervene on a different account this time because he's going to come up and he's going to say this. Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? Why are you beating up your brother? This is your family. This is your kinfolk. Why are you beating them down? Moses went out. He saw something happening. Two entirely different sets of circumstances. Moses acts differently. One, no doubt, he probably acts in rage. He acts in anger. He acts irrationally. He acts spur of the moment. The other time he thinks, well, you know what? I'll, I'll, we, we can probably talk this through. Now, hey, why are you beating up on your brother? MD, why in the world are you so hard on Melvin? Now, if you want to be hard on somebody out here in the world, somebody out in the church house, uh, outside of the church house who's being mean to Melvin, who's just picking on him, hey, that's one thing I understand that. You know, you take it up for him. Well, why are you beating him down now? I mean, hey, he's a fellow deacon of the church. Why, why are you beating him down? This is what Moses is saying. Why in the world are you spending all your time wearing out each other? You've got other things to worry about because, hey, there's going to be an Egyptian taskmaster that's going to come by here in a minute. He's going to see you two arguing and say that you're not working. And the next thing you're going to know, he's going to be laying stripes across your back. There's bigger fish to fry here. That's what all Moses is saying. Why are you beating up your brother? Now let's change all these sets of circumstances around, shall we? We're not Moses anymore. We're not looking this way and that way. We're not looking to see if anybody's looking right now. Right now, we're the Hebrews. All right? We just swap positions. Now, let's go back. You're getting beat by somebody. And you see a man who come out who you know is in a strange part of your family, if you will. And you see him because it's undeniable what he's doing. He stops and he looks this way and he looks that way and he looks to see if anybody is around and then he kills somebody. He don't really say nothing to you. He just walked up to the man that was beating you and he killed him and then he goes and drags him off and buries him. Now what are you thinking? You want to be thankful, right? But you're afraid. But you've got a story to tell when you get back to campus, ain't you? Oh, let me tell you a good. Let me tell you a good. Let me tell you, I was out there and I was working and we was, a, we was a trying to shape these stones to make uh, whatever it is that we're making. And we was out here and we was doing all this work and this guy, he's coming and he was a wailing on me and he was a beating a tar out of me. And this other Egyptian guy, you know that one is supposed to be one of us, well he comes out here and then he kills him. 
Sure enough, that word's going to spread like wildfire. Because that's a good story, ain't it? I mean, it depends on how you tell it, but that's a good story. And being people, now we can flat tell a story. We can sell anything. So then the next day, you see this guy walking around again. Walking a little taller, a little puffed up, because, you know, Moses, he's well trained in the Egyptian military, so he was probably ripped. He's a little bit buff. He's no doubt a muscular, uh, strapping-looking young man there. And he says, hey, quit fighting each other. Now what? Well, this guy saved my life yesterday. Now he's telling me to quit fighting. What now? Who does he think he is telling me that? Who's that guy think he is telling me not to be doing this? He knows nothing about my life. He don't know nothing about what I'm going through. He don't know nothing about what I've had to deal with over my lifetime because I've spent a lifetime in bondage to the to the Egyptians. He's been living a life of, uh, 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 of uh, prosperity there. He knows nothing about me. Who does he think he is telling me not to fight? Does that sound like us? No matter what he done for you yesterday, who does he think he is? Come out here. Tell me not to be arguing with him. It's 110 degrees outside and I'm still here shaping the same rock I was shaping yesterday. And he tells me not to be arguing. Guy ain't got a clue what he's talking about. God put him there to help him, did he not? Did he not? Did God not put Moses in the position to help the children of Israel? Did he or did he not? And what are these people doing? They look at him and say, who do you think you are? I seen you yesterday rubbernecking around looking to see if there's anybody looking and you went and killed somebody. And now you think you can tell me what to do? I got some dirt on you, old boy. I suggest you go on about your merry little way. You go on about your business and you leave me and my affairs alone. You don't be putting your nose where it don't belong. You don't tell me how to live my life. Now, if we was the Hebrew people, I bet you that's where we'd have been. The Bible don't go into that much detail of the story, but it does say this. Does it say, and he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Who you think you are? Who appointed you king? Who made you my judge? Yeah, I understand, Moses, that you may be coming out here to help me. But understand, I know what you did yesterday. You ain't nothing but a murderer. Who do you think you are to stand and tell me what I'm doing is wrong? Because the Bible specifically says he spoke to the one who was in the wrong, does it not? He didn't come out and he wasn't speaking to both of them as a whole. He spoke to the one who was in the wrong. Why are you beating up your brother? Who do you think you are anyways? You see where we're going now? You see the, all the different aspects we can look at this? God put Moses there. Now, God ever put anybody in your life that you refused and rejected? fair statement has God ever sent somebody to help you and you just blasted and sent back on their way because you thought they was just there casting judgment who do you think that can you believe that woman many can you believe the people that tell us that how that we're raising our kids wrong can you believe the people who stick their nose in our life and say that we need to be doing this and that we need to be doing that can you believe them people hey God not to put them there can you believe the audacity of some people that walk up and will just flat out and tell you, say, who do you think you are? You're doing that wrong. You wronged him. Why are you beating up your brother? Moses didn't have a clue in the world what he was doing. He had been raised up in the Egyptian courts and he had been no doubt to the Egyptian military school. He was raised up and he was all wise in their knowledge. He didn't know anything about the customs of the Hebrew people. All he knew was the Egyptian way. Church, 
Christians. We was raised up in the world. And that's really all we know is the world's ways. Sometimes we're not fully accustomed to the Christian way. Sometimes we're not fully accustomed to God's way of doing things. But you know what? God put us somewhere and we have to act. And we're going to act the way it comes natural. And that means nine out of ten times, church, we're going to act inside the world and not inside the body of Christ. Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? I bet 40 years later when they figured out that God sent him back, I bet that old boy had to eat some crow, don't you? They was having crow for supper that night. Who do you think you are? Well, who do you think you are? You remember, you remember what we preached on last week? You remember what the message was through two services last week? Do you remember what the messages was that God sent? It was on judgment. And what makes us think that we are qualified and capable to be a judge of someone else? Who do you think you are telling me what I'm doing is wrong? What qualifies you to even say that? How do you know that they're just there to pick on you? Who's to say that they're not sent there by an almighty being to help you and they just don't know how? Because they look this way and they look that way and they couldn't see anybody else to intervene and they've quickly realized that, hey, I'm the only one here and now I have to act, but I ain't got a clue what to do. You know what? I tried. I tried helping you do these things. I, I, I tried giving you the advice for this. And I, I, I tried, but you know, I know nothing about it. I ain't got a clue. That's why I don't understand why a woman wants the man standing beside the bed with them when they're giving birth. I ain't got a clue. Breathe. Push. Squeeze my hand. I don't care. I don't know. I'll help you the best I can, but don't you get mad at me because I don't understand. Amen. Man, you ever been in a room? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Just let it go. I mean, hey, there ain't nothing I can do about it. I don't know. But if people stick their hand out, who are we to slap it away? That's all Moses done. He acted the only way he knew how. He stuck his hand out and he says, brother, let me help you. Who do you think you are sticking your hand out to me? Mr. More holy than thou. Hey, yeah, you may be the same Hebrew as I am, but you know what? I've had to go through all these years of bondage. You've been living your life learning and, and living a high life. You've had people following you around with the big palm branches, and they've been fanning you, and you get to ride around this little carriage thing and eat grapes. That's what you get to do, and I've been out here, and I've been working. I've worked my hands to the bone. I've done this, and I've done that. You look at these scars on my back. You look at what I've had to go through, and who do you think you are? You know what's funny about Christian people? We come from all walks of life. Some of us are privileged. Some of us ain't. Some of us are hard workers. Some of us ain't got a clue in the world what, work, what the word work is. Some of us are very knowledgeable in the Bible. Some of us can spell it. Some of us can quote scripture. Some of us ain't even got a clue where our Bible's at. We come from all walks of life. But we are to bear, understand this church, listen real close right here. We are to bear one another's burdens. It don't matter if they understand you. It don't matter if they understand where you've been. It don't matter if they've been, they come from the same walk of life. It don't matter if they're the same, oh, whatever it is. If they may not be exactly who you want them to be. But that very well might have been who God sent. Now let me tell you another story. If you go back to Acts and in the seventh chapter... Acts 7.35 says this, says, This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? You understand those words? We've said those quite a bit here. 
Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in a bush. The same one that they refused is the same one who came back. Does that sound familiar to any single person sitting in the church house this morning? The same one that God sent unto the people and the people refused is the exact same one who came back. Well, God sent his son named Jesus here to this earth to be the Savior, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the Deliverer of his people. And they refused him. Well, that's the same Jesus that God the Father is going to send back. I told you that those men that strove together, that was fighting, that was having their argument, I told you that I bet you they had to eat crow. Because 40 years later when Moses came back, I bet he looked a little bit different. Jesus is going to look a little bit different too. He's going to look a whole lot more glorified. Amen. He's going to look like the king this time. But he came back. And they was probably thinking, there he is. Moses was a lot more qualified this time though, wasn't he? Who did he have? Stay with me. Who did he have? He had the Lord with him. Now, I want you to catch this. It's going to come at you real fast, so be ready. At this point, Moses no longer looked this way and that way. Where did he look? He looked one place. He looked to the Lord. Now, Christian, instead of looking this way and that way, where should you be looking? Instead of looking over here and saying, well, these people do this and these people do that, and I don't have to listen to them because they live a life like this, and who do they think they are telling me this? Instead of looking over there, and then coming over here and looking on this side, well, you know that these people should do it. This is the deacon's job. It's the preacher's job. It's this person's job. Hey, all these people need to be doing this. You know, if, if the people in the church would get up and actually work, I wouldn't have to do this. Don't look that way either. Look right there. You look back to the cross. You look at Jesus. You look up. Don't look this way and don't look that way. Don't look around the world. You look to Christ. And then I'd just be willing to bet that you won't have to act so rash. You'll know a little bit more what to say. You'll know how to conduct yourself. You won't have to go and hide what you've done. You don't have to go and try to cover it up. 